man named Gun. Gun's his last name. His dad's name was Gun, too, so. Yeah, that's okay. I figured you guys would get that part. Huh? Was it first Yeah. Uh, his daddy was a real pistol, I heard. Um, I did have a question for your Q&A. Uh, do you believe, and is there scripture that suggests that those of us that are saved and are translated, that means raptured, do you think that number of saints... I'm kind of getting the gist of what he's saying. That, that number of, of saints will be the exact same number as the fallen angels that get kicked out of heaven. Of course, God knows exactly how many will be saved. I'm just curious. I could be wrong, but I had that hunch. And here's what that's, that's based on is, you know, I, I believe a lot in typology. Um, I, I see the pictures in the Bible as showing us how things are going to happen, what's going to happen. Um, I, and I would say when things are going to happen, but I don't know when. And I was talking to some people at lunch about the first thing that I didn't study. Um, when I started studying prophecy, God very quickly said, don't bother looking for the day and the hour. You're, I'm not going to show it to you. So I just don't study that kind of stuff. But I think, I think it's in here. Surely the Lord does nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And when I look at the examples, Noah knew. Noah knew seven days. Elijah knew the day he was going to get translated. Fifty of the sons of the prophets knew. Elisha knew. They all knew. Lot knew what was going to happen with Sodom. God always has a way of telling his people only what he's going to do. And it's right here in the Bible, and anybody can have access to it. It's not some secret knowledge that only us will know from a secret book somewhere. It's right here. Of course, we can't see it yet. But anyway, my, my idea was I know what God said about the promised land, uh, turn to, I know where to tell you to turn to. Hang on a second. Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 4, I believe. God tells us exactly why, I think, is where it is. Uh, let's see here. Is it Deuteronomy 4? No. Deuteronomy 7, maybe. Let's see here. Uh, may Lord help me find it. Okay, I got you. Um... Verse 7 of Deuteronomy 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Um, and I'm not seeing here what um, I have read But God had told Israel, yeah, I don't see it right away. God had told Israel, he said, the reason why I'm giving you this land, number one, I promised it to Abraham. But number two, yeah, uh, it's probably Deuteronomy 9 or Deuteronomy 18. But anyway, God had told Israel, he said, when you get into that land and you see all their gods, and you see them doing divination, and you see them doing um, uh, astrology, you see them uh, doing all these forbidden practices that I told you not to do, don't do them. 
because it's for that reason that I'm kicking them out of that land and I'm allowing you to come in to live in their land. And God had told Israel, he said, when you come into that land, what you're going to find is cities already built. You're not going to have to build cities when you get to that land. There's already cities there and people have been living in them, but I'm going to kick those people out and you're going to come and live in their houses. And so I take that then and I apply it to what we know God is going to do. There is a group of angels in heaven that are dwelling in that estate and they're going to get kicked out. God's going to throw them out. Satan's going to take his tail and, to, and cast them down to the earth. Then God is going to allow us to go up to be in heaven where they used to be. We're swapping places with devils is what we're doing. So that's, I think, where uh, the brother gets that idea from. I, he's heard me talk about it. And when he asked about do I think it's going to be the same number as the angels that get kicked out? Well, here I thought about it. And I thought, how many angels are going to get kicked out? Well, we don't have an exact number, and there's a reason why we don't have an exact number. It's because the angels are innumerable. There, there is an inf infinite number of angels. So how can you count to infinity, okay? You, we can't. There's no way we can, but God can. He not only can count to infinity, he's above the highest number, if that makes sense. And God knows how to take an innumerable amount of angels and cut a third off and throw them out of heaven and of us, and Israel, what did he say? He said, I will make you as the sand of the sea for number. So that if you could number the sand of the sea, that's how many of you I will make. And then he said, I will make you as the stars of heaven for number. So that if you could count the stars. So in that way, yes, we're going to be the same amount. Are you, are you still not hearing me or what? Let me, let me read this here. Humming. Oh, I know where it's coming from. It's coming from this fan, I think. Does that make it better? Okay. The fan is vibrating the floor, and it's vibrating all these microphones. That's where it's coming from. Anyway, we're going to be as the angels of heaven, the Bible says, which means as innumerable as they are, that's what we're going to be. Now, I don't think we can even fathom that with our little minds that we have. But, I, that, but the idea, I think, is right. We're going to replace those angels that have been cast out of heaven, we're going to take their position in God's heaven, be as the angels, which is exactly what Jesus said, for they shall be as the angels in the resurrection, which neither marry nor are given in marriage. And we're going to be as innumerable or as infinite and eternal and everlasting as those angels that were kicked out were and the ones that still exist are. We're going to judge angels is what the Bible says. So anyway, that's a good question. Um, and after we get done with this session, we'll kind of be thinking, write something down if you want to, and um, we'll do some questions and answers, and then we'll call it a day. All right. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to Numbers 21. We are still, still dealing with our supernatural Bible. Things happened in the Bible, and 
I want you to think of it this way. Um, if you've never seen an angel, if you've never seen a river parted to where there's dry land there, if you did not, if you've never seen God appear on a mountaintop with thunder and lightning and fire and vapors of smoke and the sound of a trumpet, if you've never heard or seen anything like that, if you've never seen any of the miracles that Israel saw, Israel saw a, a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of fire by night. I've never seen anything like that, ever. Okay? But what is it that makes us different than the Jews? The Jews saw the pillar of fire every day, the pillar of uh, smoke or the pillar of cloud every day, the pillar of fire by night. They saw the water, the Red Sea parted. They saw Jericho part and become dry land with the Ark of the Covenant sticking in the middle of it. The, in the days of Joshua, each man, one man from each tribe went and picked up a stone and set it in the midst of the River Jordan as an, and took 12 stones out of the River Jordan and set them up on the banks as a token, as an everlasting token that the waters parted in this spot somewhere in the River Jordan. There are 12 stones down in that river. And somewhere on the bank, there's 12 stones up on the bank that used to be in the river. Because, and that's why God did it. He said, I want perpetual generations to know what you saw on this day. You saw the rivers part and you walked across on dry ground. As soon, in fact, the Bible says, as soon as the high priest's foot touched, that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as it touched the water, it went like that. And they got to see all of that. And for all of that, they didn't believe God. Imagine that. They were shown signs and wonders every single day. Manna came down from heaven every single day except the Sabbath day. They were fed of God. They were given, Bible says, they were given the food of angels. Angels food cake. I love angels food cake. Strawberries and whipped cream. Amen. They were given that every day and they didn't, they didn't believe what God said. You would think that if they saw the miracles and the mighty acts and the supernatural events that took place, that they would believe what God said, but they didn't. And yet, here's us. I've never seen the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. I've never seen manna. I've never seen, I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen a spirit, an angel, a haunt. I've never seen anything, a fiery serpent. I've never seen anything like that. But I believe it. And, and that's what Jesus said to Timothy. When Timothy said, unless I can put my finger through the hole in his hand, put my hand in the wound in his side, I will not believe. And then Jesus appeared in front of him. And Jesus is going, here it is, Timothy. And Timothy fell on the ground and he said, my Lord and my God. And uh, he said, help my unbelief. And Jesus blessed him. And he said, blessed art thou for believing because thou hast seen and believed. But yea, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. We didn't see Jesus. We didn't see him resurrected. We didn't see the nails in his hands and the hole in his side. We didn't see that, but we believe it. It's the core of our faith is the risen Christ who had been dead and is now alive. So in the things that I'm showing you today, I'm showing you things that appeared 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago that the Israelites saw time after time and they didn't believe a word that God said. It was not, they had the gospel preached to them, Paul said, but it was not mingled with faith. They just didn't believe what God said. They had no faith in God whatsoever. So we get the advantage of seeing these stories and believing them that they actually happened exactly the way the Bible said they happened. So in Numbers 21, uh, I have verse 6 up on the screen, but let's get the gist of it. 
um, in verse 4 of Numbers 21, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And I can tell you, I know that discouragement. I think we all do. We all have been discouraged because at times God has made our way hard and difficult. And so it happens. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. They didn't like it. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Now, remember what we learned earlier. What, what are angels and spirits made of? Fire. So it is obvious that these are not just snakes. They are devils. Okay? They're devils. And they are made of a fiery substance. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Moses is a type of Christ here. He's the, he's the mediator between Israel and God. But Moses died, so he can no longer be the mediator anymore. Only Jesus now can be the mediator. Um, and so in verse 8, the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. And set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So Moses made a serpent of brass. So now you have a clue. When you're looking for what means what in the Bible, you just learned that brass equals fire. When you see brass in the Bible, it represents fire. Moses didn't make literally a fire snake. He made one out of brass. What did they later do with this that Moses made? Later on, they kept this thing. What did they do with it? They prayed to it. They burned incense to it and called it Nahushtan, which is the Hebrew word for fiery serpent or whatever. They, they, that was their God. They were praying to Satan. They were praying to Lucifer. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That's that, and Paul said that story. Jesus said it as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So here he's teaching the gospel of grace through faith. Because if you believe what Moses said, and believe me, when you're an Israelite at this time and you see 20, 30,000 Jews fall over dead because they were bitten by devil snakes, if Moses said, climb a tree and hang upside down, you climbed a tree and hung upside down. Amen? That's what you did. Who are you waving to? Kevin York. I know you're trying to get in touch with somebody. You're going back in like this. Anyway. Okay. Hi, Joey. Everybody say hi, Joey. Yeah. Amen. See, wasn't that, wasn't that, wasn't that easy to say? Everybody say hi to Joey. Okay. All right. So do you believe that these were not ordinary snakes? Not pythons. They were not rattlesnakes. They're not black snakes. And you can scare me with all of them. You can say they're not poisonous. Uh-uh. I don't like them. Uh-uh. I'll, I'll jump an H-strand barbed wire fence to get away from a non-poisonous snake. I don't like them. I don't think you ought to own one as pets. And that's just me. I'm just, just joking. But I do not like snakes at, for nothing. Oh, they're good to keep around to eat mice. Uh -uh, I don't want them. I can handle the mice. Anyway, these were real devil spirit serpents that God released into the camp of Israel 
and they bit these people and they died. And the, think about what that represents. It was the serpent who poisoned Eve, thus poisoning all of us with sin. Are we not all sinners? Have we not all been bitten by that serpent? What then is our remedy? As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The remedy is the same. Look and live. Grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. Somebody say amen. Now, this, and, and, and I have up here, this story must be true. This story must be true. It must have happened exactly the way God said. Because Jesus based the symbolism of the cross upon the serpent on the pole. So if, that's, if this story in Numbers 21 didn't happen, then Jesus lied through his teeth. And it was Paul that said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So the story of the devil serpents coming into the camp of the Israelites cannot be a fable. It cannot be a myth. It cannot be uh, a made-up or make-believe story. It had to have happened. Just like the giants. The book of Hebrews, I think it's chapter 4, goes into great detail telling us not to be like the Israelites who provoked God back in Numbers 13 and Numbers 14 over that deal over the giants. And when I studied giants, I did not know that I believe Paul wrote Hebrews and Paul was laying out the scenario that if there were not giants in the land of Canaan at the time of Moses... He's basing, Paul is basing his whole argument then on a myth and a fable, if it wasn't true. So it was true. It actually happened. So Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And say this with me, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And see, the serpents have been there in your life too, haven't they? Because they've had influence on you. They've bitten you. You have the disease called sin nature. Sin natureitis. It's an inflammation. Okay? And it's awfully painful. And the only remedy is to trust Jesus Christ and trust his word. That's the only remedy to be healed from it. That's the only way to live by it. Amen. So I, I believe these serpents are still around. We may not see them, but they're still around. I actually have a picture. I have a picture I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, let me skip this. In this is in um, Chichen Itza. I want to say chicken pizza. <laughs> Chichen Itza. This is the pyramid of Kukulkan. Kukulkan. Kuku sounds like cuckoo, like a bird, right? And it's because this is in Mexico, and they built this pyramid to worship the feathered flying serpent god called Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl all through Mexico, Central America, and South America, they all worshipped a fiery, flying, feathered serpent. They called it different names, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl Kukulkan, but it was all the same God. They worshipped Satan. Or a, I would say, either Satan himself or a similar angel, evil angel. And what's interesting is on one day of the year, one day of the year, June 21st, the summer solstice, 
on this one day. They built this pyramid so that if you look, the steps on the corner, the way the sun hits it, you see how the shadow comes down the staircase like this, like a serpent. They built it that way for exactly that reason. So that on the summer solstice, the shadow would hit the corner of the pyramid in exactly the right way to make it look like their feathered serpent God was descending from heaven. Isn't it neat? Because that's true. Only he's not going to descend. He's getting thrown out. Amen. But they worshiped that. They worshiped. They had this God and they believed that this God, the reason why they built this pyramid was they believed this God was coming back to them. Does anybody here know Spanish? Huh? Okay. I know what Paco means. What does that say? El regreso de la serpiente emplumada. Serpiente, serpent. Implumada, plumage. Feathers. El regreso. The dissension or the return of the feathered serpent. That's what that says. It was a book written by this guy. Notice that he put a cross on it. What did Moses make in the wilderness? A brass pole, put a serpent on it. And what did later did they do? They worshipped it, didn't they? See, the same religion that used to be still is. Same, that's exactly right. And it, and it derives from that story that there's healing in... It's funny because the New Agers say there's healing in the serpent. Us Christians say, no, no, no. There's healing in killing that serpent. <laughs> Amen? Which is what Christ did on the cross. Because Colossians says he made a show of his enemies openly nailing them to his cross. So he became sin for us who knew no sin. He took on death, which is Satan. Satan has the power of death. He took on himself death. He took on himself all the sins of mankind, took on the commandments that were against us and nailed them to his cross. And in killing them, he destroyed his enemies in his death. It's just like Samson. How did Samson defeat his enemies? In his, the Bible says he killed the more enemies in his death than he did in his life. He's a pick, and he's doing this when he takes the pillars. Mm, I love this. And who's, who's up on the roof of that temple? All the people, all the, like the people, how many were there? 3,000 people up there. You know what they represent? A third of the angels in heaven. And what happened to all of them when Samson brought those pillars down? Listen to your Bibles. You're getting it now. Isn't that neat how God put that in there like that? You just saw Bible prophecy right there in the story of Samson. How it's going to happen. It's going to happen exactly. That. Did you know that heaven is held up by pillars, the Bible says? Because he said the pillars of heaven shall shake. And because God's going to shake them. And when he shakes them, all those angels are going to come falling down. Mm -mm -mm. Take a look at this. Now, let me tell you what this is. Yes, Steve. Yes, it is. Exactly. In case you don't know what he's talking about. Um, Einstein's theory of relativity, along with other physics that has come along since then, they actually believe that it is possible to warp space and time. Okay? How many sort of in that circle? 
You know, I didn't count. How many? Did you count them? Are you counting them now? Okay. You want my glasses? I don't know. There could be. The one in the middle being 33. I get that. But science actually says it's possible to warp space and time instead of us taking 10 months to get to Mars. If we could learn how to bend space and time, we could get there in a few minutes rather than 10 months. God knows how to do this because the Bible says that the, when the Lord comes down, he bows the heavens. God is literally going to bend heaven and come down to this earth. Just like in Star Trek, just like in all these other science fiction movies, that's what your Bible says God's going to do. I just think that's cool, but I get that. Um, this picture, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, who um, was an ER doctor and a really good one, and he left all of that behind to chase UFOs. He has worked with a man who was going to be a Jesuit priest, ends up being a Supreme Court lawyer in Washington, D.C. And this man has done some high-profile cases in Washington, D.C. He's really smart. I've listened to him talk. But he has worked with people who have been in the military, people who have worked in the Department of Defense, people who have worked various high places in government that have had encounters with UFOs, and he's got them all to come forward and say, this is what we saw, and we swear, we'll swear to testify before Congress that we know UFOs are real. Then what he does is, Stephen Greer has been in contact with who he believes are space beings ever since his college days. Um, you sent me that video of a young, young lady. She couldn't be in her, what, 20s? Uh, and she's telling her story of how she's been in all these different cults and different religions, but it started out at a young age with her being in contact with what she called aliens. And I'm talking, how old was she when, did she ever give her age at that time? About seven years old, she is in contact with what she calls aliens, but what they are are devils. And what's interesting is, is that she grows up and joins these new age cults and doesn't call them aliens anymore. Now she's in contact with spirits, ascended masters, the gods, basically, but they're the same thing. So Stephen Greer teaches people what's called close encounters of the fifth kind. How to contact the aliens to get them to come and present themselves to us. His dream, Stephen Greer's dream, is that the whole world one day will call down the space visitors to come and heal our planet and be the saviors of mankind. That's his goal. That's what he does with his time now. And he has a lot of very high profile government officials, senators, congressmen backing him on this thing. So at a, an event that he was at where he teaches these people how to meditate, empty their mind, get in contact with these aliens, these devils, a guy snaps a picture and catches this on film. It's a, it is a serpent. You look at the close-up. It's a serpent. Now back it up a little bit. You can even see the, the spinal cord of this thing. This is a spirit that was captured on film and it touched this guy's forehead and they said the guy actually had what he called a kundalini experience. Does anybody know what that is? Remember what I showed you last night, that they believe you have a serpent at the base of your spine. When you release that serpent, He'll come up your spine and activate your pineal gland and give you your third eye enlightenment. Basically, it's like a form of the mark of the beast. It's what Hindus, it's why Hindus put their, that red dot on their forehead. To them, it's a sign that they have been enlightened because they worship the 330 million gods that they have. 
And I believe those 330 million gods are the third of the angels that are going to fall from heaven one of these days. But that is a fiery flying serpent right out of the Bible touching this man, just like in your Bible. Now, the Hebrew word for serpent in the Old Testament was nachash. In India, because I think languages shared words, in India, they worship the Nagas. You see the comparison, Nakash and Nagas? It's very similar. So in India, they worship the Nagas. And Nagas are, I mean, take a look at these dragons. What do they have coming out of their heads? Flames. They're fiery, flying dragons. How many cultures around the world have stories of flying dragons? Even the British, Europeans. But the difference between the East and the West is, in the West, dragons were always evil. In the East, China and Japan, dragons were beneficial, benevolent gods that they worshipped. Okay? So, check this one out. You want to count something for me, Kevin? Count how many heads is on this serpent. Seven. And there's a Buddha hidden in there. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Who do they worship in India right now? China, Japan. Who are they worshiping? The beast. The Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's who they worship. And see, the combination of the serpents with the man there, and I'll show you this later, in one part of the Bible, we see him as being the man of sin. In Revelation 13, we see him as being the beast. Which is he? Both. He's the man beast. Pretty sure that was a science fiction movie at one time. Um, Isaiah 14. Rejoice not thou whole Palestina because the rod of him that smote thee is broken for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. The fiery flying serpent I believe is a reference to the Antichrist because he comes out of the serpent's root. What does a root represent in the Bible? It's like where you came, where you, what are your roots? What are your roots? Where you came from? Your forefathers. DNA. Thank you. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Isaiah 30 verse 6, the burden of the beast of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and old lion, the viper, the fiery flying serpent. See, these are real creatures that your Bible is telling you about. And they didn't go away 3,000 years ago. They're still around. And one guy just happened to have captured a photograph. I think it wanted to be seen. I think we're living in a time now where there are more people now who would probably openly worship Satan himself than there used to be when my grandfather was young. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Okay. Openly worshiping dragons, serpents, gods, aliens, instead of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're in a different world now. And I think that as time goes on, these things don't have a problem starting to show themselves around the world. Um, let's see here. I've been wanting to do this for days and I don't feel like doing it. A cockatrice. The Bible mentioned a cockatrice. What is a cockatrice? 
It's basically another word for flying serpent. A winged, plumed, feathered serpent. And what's interesting to me, Will, do you remember when Jurassic Park, the movie, came out? They introduced in that movie a theory that had just sort of came out back in the early 90s that the paleontologists that studied dinosaurs changed their opinion about where dinosaurs came from. They said that they had reason to believe that dinosaurs actually derived from birds instead of reptiles. That at one time, dinosaurs, dragons, had feathers on them. That's what Jurassic Park introduced to the world. How true is that now when you see what's in your Bible? Here you have a, pro a prophecy from Isaiah. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion and shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, the cockatrices are still around because this is a reference to the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And they will not hurt people. They will not be allowed to hurt even a child who be able to put his hand on a cockatrice den and not be, not be harmed. Cockatrices represent the presence of sin. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Uh, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. He's speaking of them as they were real. Uh, Jeremiah 8, 17. Behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. We've heard of Indian snake charmers, right? So we're not talking about of earthly, physical, in this world, serpents. We're talking about spirits that God said you won't be able to control them. You'll have no control over them whatsoever. They will bite you and they will destroy you. God's going to release them on this earth. Serpents and cockatrices. It's called a cockatrice because it has feathers like a chicken. What does Kukulkan sound like? Cuckoo. Um, what's the Swahili word for chicken? Huh? Isn't it um, cuckoo? Okay, so cuckoo con cockatrice because the serpents have feathers on them. They were called basilisks back a few hundred years ago. The word basilisk comes from the Greek word basileus, which means king, because the feathers on their head resembled a crown. And that's what you see in Isaiah 14, 29. Uh, there have been legends, stories of living cockatrices on the earth. People have seen them. Um, I've covered this before, so I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to move on to this. Owls and aliens, what time is it? All right, you think so, huh? You don't want to take a break? You're going to kill me. All right. Job 30, verse 29. He said, I'm a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. There are several statements. I've been studying the book of Job. I've read it, and I'm going to read it again. Because many statements made in the book of Job, I believe, are a reference to the Antichrist. At one point, Job said that God had broken him to pieces and set me up for his mark. And I believe that that's a reference to the mark of the beast. 
And here Job says, I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. Now, what kind of owls is he talking about? Psalm 102, verse 6, I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. Now, we know that owls come out what time of day? Yeah, they don't come out at day. They come out at night. So Isaiah 13, you can turn there, underline this in your Bible. Verse 19, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's what I believe, that it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. When you read Revelation 17 and 18, especially 18, you see that God has a future destruction of Babylon because he said Babylon is fallen, is fallen. He said it twice meaning it's going to happen twice. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. What does doleful mean? Does anybody know? Like mourning. What, is, what sound does a dove make? It's a crying, wailing sound. And that's what he means by that. Like, it sounds like people when they're crying or they're mourning over losing somebody. And owls shall dwell there. And satyrs shall dance there. Now, I've never seen a satyr. But I believe in them. I believe they're of the spiritual world. And these owls that he's talking about are not just regular owls. He's talking about spirits. The wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces. This is why I believe houses can be inhabited by spirits. Places in deserts, places in mountains, places in the forest can be inhabited by spirits. There are spirits who dwell on this earth and they there are places that they like to live in just like other beasts. Those deer that have been coming out in your yard, okay? They only come out there when they think nobody else is out there, but Sterling's standing in his window watching them, okay? Well... Do they come in the house when you open the garage door? No, they don't live in your house. They have a place that they feel comfortable. And usually in our neck of the woods, it's usually in a cedar thicket. That's where you're going to see a flattened spot in the grass because that's where they bed down because there's cover there. That's where they like to live. That's their nature. And there are devils. What did Jesus say? Foxes have and birds have... He's telling you something. He's telling you something about spirits. That they all have a place that they like to live. And if you in your life are serving God, dedicated to God, spending time in prayer, spending time in the Word of God, I guarantee you spirits can't hang around there very long. They can't. Because you've made a place that they do not like to live. However, you start drinking, taking drugs, looking at filthy things on the internet, listening to certain music, doing certain rituals, I guarantee you, dragons and owls will show up, and serpents. And see, I've had people who've come out of backgrounds like that, and they've told me, man, we've seen things freak you out. And I believe them. I believe them. Okay? This Bible's right. Isaiah 34, same thing. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven. By the way, these birds that he's talking about are on the list of birds that God said the Israelites could not eat. They were unclean. And generally, 
They were birds that consumed flesh rather than seeds. Think about it. A bird that likes carnal things is different than, say, a dove. A dove will only eat seeds, grains, things like that. What is seed? The Word of God. That's why the dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit and a raven is not. Okay? So, if you've got ravens in your life, it's because you and the ravens like to feed off the same thing. Carnal things. Rather than spiritual things. But if you have a dove in your heart, in your life, the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is there and you like to feed on good things from the Word of God. Makes sense now, doesn't it? These are things, God said, don't even eat eagles. Don't eat them. Why? Because they eat flesh things. Now, there was a movie that came out a few years ago, and I was just amazed at this movie. It's called The Fourth Kind, and it's based upon J. Allen Hynek's classification of UFOs. Close encounter of the first kind is a sighting. Close encounter of the second kind is actual evidence that there was a landing or a, a crash or something, a picture or a video made of the UFO. There's evidence there. That's the second kind. Close encounter of the third kind is contact with an alien creature. That was Steven Spielberg's movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The close encounter of the fourth kind is an alien abduction. And this particular movie was made about alien abductions. And here, and you have a, a, a woman who's playing a part in this movie. And because her, her appearance, she's gone crazy because she's been interviewing these people as a psychotherapist. She's been interviewing these people who are having these really bad episodes at night and they say they're seeing owls outside their home, staring in their windows at them. What's really going on in this movie is that these people are being abducted by these gray aliens. Whitley Stryber wrote a book back in the early 90s called Communion. And up until this time, this, this sort of form of what these aliens supposedly look like was not very well known throughout the world. When he wrote this book, he had an artist paint this picture of the alien that he was in contact with multiple times in his life. And people were, by, were looking at this book and reacting to it because they were going, I've been seeing these things. I've been contacted by these things. By the way, remember I mentioned earlier today the incubus and the succubus? This particular alien, Whitley Stryber said, was a female that he had engaged with multiple times and said it was the most intense experience he'd ever had in his whole life. Whitley Stryber is evil. Okay? But owls were featured as the front of these aliens. Um... The prince of the power of the air. And what are, what are these owls? The rulers of the darkness of this world. This was actually drawn by a contactee. That's what they call them now. They don't call them abductees. They call them contactees. Because they were told that when they thought aliens, they would see owls. And a guy by the name of Mike Clellan started doing research into contactees and their relationship with owls. And here's what he wrote. Researchers of the alien abduction phenomenon will point out that owls have an eerie likeness to the commonly reported gray alien. One researcher has a few cases where the small gray aliens telepathically told the abductees that, quote, you will remember us as an owl. 
a man by the name of Joe Montanato, who runs an organization called International Community for Alien Research, says, quote, we regularly get reports of people seeing owls standing on the side of the road, usually about four foot tall. Now, to my knowledge, there are no four foot tall owls on the earth anywhere. So what are they seeing? They're seeing what the Bible said they're seeing. They're seeing spirits manifesting in front of them. Um, these owls often are messengers, a channeled message from an owl slash alien. Why have you come to the earth? The person asked, why have you come to the earth? The alien said, my soul agreed to be part of an experiment on earth. The person said, what's your mission? The owl said, we are part of a much larger group of beings and our overseers who keep the interdimensional highways clear of op and open in order to be accessed by all. We are helping to lift the veil of illusion on earth, meaning Christianity, so that all beings can awaken and remember the truth that all living forms are one. Everything is energy. And that's all a bunch of new age, satanic doctrine. Okay? And it came from an owl. Okay? Which was a spirit. Abductees are seeing real owls and they lock eyes and they'll describe receiving a psychic download from the owls. The nature of some of these messages is that we humans need to be better stewards of our planet. This is exactly the same communication that abductees report receiving from aliens while on board their ships. There is a connection.